Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sec our second panel for today, entitled Decolonizing Planning. And the panel asks the following questions. What does it mean to decolonize planning, both normatively and in practice? How do we learn from theorize and practice post-colonial, decolonial, and abolitionist planning while placing these movements in their proper and distinct historical and academic contexts? And given historical and ongoing realities of settler colonialism, white supremacy, economic precarity, and neoliberal inequality, and war and occupation, what role can should planners play in engaging the field's histories, its dispossessed presence, and what futures could be imagined from these radical thought and practice traditions that could represent possibilities and potentials for the field to envision and inscribe socially just and contextually suited interventions. We have amazing four speakers today. I'm very excited. So I'm going to introduce uh, the four speakers before they uh, uh, start uh, sharing uh, their work. So our first speaker is Professor Ananya Roy, who's professor of planning at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles, as well as the director of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy. Among her books are City Requiem, Calcutta, Gender and the Politics of Poverty, Urban uh, Informality, Transnational Perspectives from the Middle East, South Asia, and Latin America, uh, Worlding Cities, Asian Experiments and the Art of Being Global, and Territories of Poverty, Rethinking North and South, among many other influential um, publications. She's currently leading a National Science Foundation, uh, a research network uh, on housing justice in unequal cities that is building a shared terrain of scholarship across universities and movements to advance ideas, practices, programs, and policies of housing justice in LA, and as well as in other cities in the world. Her work is also concerned with combating racial banishment or the systematic removal of working class communities of color from urban cores to the far peripheries of metropolitan regions, as well as advancing scholarship on sanctuary cities, which seeks uh, to expand practices of welcome and hospitality to account for long histories of settler colonialism, imperialism, and slavery. Uh, and Professor Roy, she, she was also my PhD advisor at UC Berkeley. <laughs> Our second speaker is Professor Andrea Roberts, who's Assistant Professor of Urban Planning and an Associate Director of the Center for Housing and Urban Development at Texas A&M University. Her research identifies planning and historic preservation practices that sustain cultural resilience and quests for social justice within the African diaspora. Dr. Roberts' work has been inspirational in the ways in which she brings more than a decade of experience in community and economic development to her scholarship, and in the ways in which she incorporates participation on multiplicity of voices in her public intellectual engagements. She's also the founder of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, a research and social justice initiative documenting black placemaking, uh, placemaking history and grass, grassroots preservation, engaging in ethnographic archival and ar uh, action research using digital humanities platforms to make marginalized groups endangered voices visible and relevant to scholars. Our third speaker is Professor Oren Yaftakhal, who's a professor of planning and geography at Ben Gurion, Gurion University of the Najaf. He has worked on critical theories of space and power, minorities and public policy, ethnocratic society and land regimes. Among his books are Ethnocracy, Land and Identity Politics in Israel-Palestine, and Empty Lands, Illegal Geography of Bedouin Rights in the Negev. Yiftakhel's work on the dark side of planning has been transformational for my own thinking, as well as the thinking of many other, other studying planning in contested spaces. Professor Yiftakhel is also an activist and has been member of never, uh, several organizations, served as a board member of B'Tselem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. Uh, as well as co-founding a uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace movement. He has also worked as a planner and advocate with the indigenous Bedouin populations in the Najaf. And last but not least, I welcome Professor Vanessa Watson, who is a professor of city planning in the School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics at the University of Cape Town. Her work seeks to, seeks to unsettle the geopolitics of knowledge, production, and planning by providing alternative theoretical perspectives from the global south, placing power and conflict as inevitable and central to planning processes, and grounding planning ideas in an understanding of social diversity and difference. Her seminal paper on seeing from the south, refocusing urban planning on the global's, uh, globe's central urban issues has been foundational for all of us who think about planning from the global south as well as the global north. She has played a key role in setting up the Association of African Planning Schools, and that has been uh, her concern with thinking about planning pedagogy uh, on the African uh, continent. 
I welcome all four of you. I'm so excited. Thank you for, very much for accepting for my invitation. And we'll start prof with Professor Roy. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hiba, um, for organizing this conference and for the invitation to be a part of it. It's a very special pleasure to be a part of this panel with Andrea, Oren, and Vanessa. I'm going to share screen. Um, so my talk today is titled Planning the Post-Colony, or you can also read this as Planning in the Post-Colony. Now, the title of this panel is Decolonizing Planning, and I see that as a provocation rather than as a possibility. In other words, I use the term decolonizing with great caution, because like so many other terms of critical thought, the term has come to be appropriated, depoliticized, and put into fast-paced circulation. So what does it even mean in relation to planning? It is the endurance of colonial relationalities that seems to be all around us in the worlds of knowledge making and space, space making that we call planning. And I want to be clear that when I talk about planning today in my talk, I am talking about um, the institutionality of planning. So there are, of course, many modes of planning, but I'm particularly interested in planning as an institution with uncanny proximity to state power. So what might decolonizing planning put forward for us as a provocation rather than as a possibility? Though I will talk about possibilities as well. In the histories and theories of planning course that I teach each fall at UCLA, a core course for our incoming graduate school, uh, students, I assign two foundational essays on the decolonial imperative. These essays challenge my students, and I think they present a challenge to us gathered here today in Zoom world as well. The first is Walter Mignolo's Epistemic Disobedience, Independent Thought, and Decolonial Freedom. The second is Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Young's Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. The epistemic privilege of which Mignolo writes, the coloniality of knowledge, continues in our academic formations. Despite fierce critique, the epistemological and methodological foundations of urban studies and planning remain committed to what George Lipsitz has called the white spatial imaginary. Many of us have now become what I call citationary alibis that nod to post-colonial or feminist thought or to black geographies or to thinking from the South while keeping intact structures of white theory. As I argued in my talk at the Harvard GSD earlier this week, our presence in planning academia will not suffice to transform such structures. The making of black, brown and indigenous presence in the global university has taken place amidst what Grace Hong calls regimes of racial management. So we diversify, but we do not decolonize. In decolonization is not a metaphor, Tuck and Yang remind us that decolonial des desires can enact resettlement and reoccupation. Decolonization, they insist, must bring about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. But we are, as this very snarky tweet from the Decolonial Atlas reminds us, far removed from such repatriation. Our institutions have taken to the comfort, for example, of land acknowledgements and other gestures of what Libby Porter and Janice Parry have described as recognition. But recognition, like presence, will not suffice, not to decolonize. For as Tuck and Yang remind us, decolonization requires giving land back. How do we do so? From within and against land grab universities and land grab professions. So in my recent essay, Planning on Stolen Land, which is part of a planning theory and practice interface curated by Libby Porter and Crystal Legacy, I argue that planning is especially resistant to land back. 
that while we dabble endlessly with land use regulation, we sidestep the questions of land and property, invoking technocratic practicality, what I call the tyranny of practicality, to whitewash planning's central role in state organized violence, including the theft of land, and thus negating the imperative for land reparations. And so today, I suggest that we think about decolonizing planning not as a possibility, but rather as a provocation. And for me, the provocation requires thinking about the post-colony, especially the United States of empire as post-colony. By this, I mean the active repositioning of the cities of the North Atlantic in the global histories of slavery, colonialism, and imperialism. But by this, I also mean attention to spatial formations that necessarily exceed the meanings that we have ascribed to the urban. The urban is the taken for granted modifier of planning. What if we were to instead, following Clyde Woods, consider plantation logics and neo-plantation planning? I'm especially interested in how the post-colony governs property producing the categories of tenancy, real estate, rent, and more that serve as the coordinates of liberalism and the coordinates of planning. So for example, in a brilliant essay titled Money Mortgages and the Conquest of America, Kesu Park, legal and critical race studies scholar, shows how land became liquid in colonial America. Park shows that while English property law did not treat land as chattel, settler colonists engaged in predatory lending practices to Native Americans created foreclosure as a brand new American commodity. That didn't happen in the 1980s. It happened in the 1650s and 1660s. And by the 1670s, colonial laws instituted foreclosure in America enabling and legitimizing the widespread theft of land from indigenous people and turning land into real estate. If we follow this genealogy of possession laid out by Kesu Park, then we realize that so many of the towns of Massachusetts were grabbed and stolen by father William Pinchon and son John Pinchon through the use of foreclosure against indigenous people. Here laid bare is property its theft. What then is decolonization? And is there a role for planning in it? Now, taking back the towns of New England and this kind of decolonization of planning may very well be an impossibility, though I'd like to think that it is perhaps a possibility. But I'd like to foreground instead the possibilities that are opened up in the post-colony, especially during the moment at hand, a moment that I see to be one of conjoined crisis and uprising. The crisis is that of the lived inequalities of racial capitalism exposed and deepened by a global pandemic. And the uprising is, as my comrade Robin D.G. Kelly has put it, a rebellion against the death-making apparatus of racial capitalism of which police is an integral part. So let me be clear. The possibilities at hand are not the decolonial freedom of which Mignolo dreams or the decolonization that Tuck and Yang demand. The possibilities are perhaps more circumscribed, but worth considering. In a recent essay in public books, I term these possibilities emergency urbanism. And I argue specifically that property has become the insurgent ground of emergency urbanism, a site of open rebellion against global racial capitalism and its protocols of rent and debt. I borrow the idea of insurgent ground from Saidia Hartman's stunning book, Wavered Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which I think is one of the most important texts to understand the American city. Hartman foregrounds the insurgent ground of the lives of young Black women who struggle to create autonomous and beautiful lives through open rebellion, 
She therefore allows us to think about uprising as a long arc of rebellion rather than a singular moment of crisis and protest. Along similar lines, Salwa Ismail's work has shown that behind the spectacular occupations of the Arab Spring was the prolonged emergency wrought by impoverished livelihoods, precarious housing, intensifying policing. These oppressions took shape, she shows, in the informal neighborhoods of cities such as Cairo, in the micro processes of everyday life, creating oppositional subjectivities and infrastructures of protest. So if property has become the insurgent ground of emergency urbanism, then I would assert that, for example, here in Los Angeles, this is most visible in two spaces of struggle, the public stake in property, rent as theft. And I present these to you today, not as decolonial possibilities, but as post-colonial possibilities. So from Moms for Housing in Oakland to reclaiming our homes in Los Angeles, to the widespread call to commandeer vacant hotels as housing, insurgent housing movements are insisting on the public stake in property and flipping the script of eminent domain. But of course, we must constantly keep in mind the militarized assault deployed by the state against such movements, as we saw with Moms for Housing, as well as with reclaiming our homes. If eminent domain has been widely used as a tool of urban development, benefiting the property classes, then what does it mean to use this master's tool for the purposes of housing justice? Hillside Villas in LA's Chinatown is especially on my mind because some of the long-standing tenants there were displaced by eminent domain during the construction of the LA Convention Center and are now fighting for the use of eminent domain for public acquisition of their building whose affordable housing covenant has expired. And what is fascinating about the time of emergency specifically a public health emergency, is that the law mediates a different relationship between sovereignty and property. It is thus that legal reason has repeatedly asserted that during the pandemic, the mayor of Los Angeles has the police power to commandeer private property. And thus you see many of us on Twitter saying, seize the fucking hotels. And it is thus that the courts across the US have repeatedly in this last year rejected the opposition of landlord lobbies to eviction moratoria, ruling that such moratoria do not violate the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment or create other irreparable economic harm to real estate interests. And so in this moment, just for this moment, it becomes possible to mobilize the police power of the state for the protection of human life, rather than the protection of property. The question of rent is especially interesting. So while Dennis Block, Los Angeles's infamous eviction attorney, argues that a moratorium on evictions constitutes legal theft from landlords, the Los Angeles Tenants Union responds that rent itself is theft. This is the capacious imagination of emergency urbanism and its critique of rentier capitalism. Indeed, as rental debt grows, so does the political demand for rent cancellation. This is Carol Fife, co-founder of Moms for Housing and newly elected Oakland City Council member, reminding us of rental debt. And for those of you not in the US, um, the scope of the evictions to come and of this rental debt debt is staggering. Um, we estimate that nearly 495,000 renter households in Los Angeles are at risk of eviction when the eviction courts reopen later this year. A few weeks ago, PolicyLink released new analysis showing that rental debt in California from the time of the pandemic is about $3.7 billion and water debt is at about a billion dollars. Needless to say, this is debt borne disproportionately by black, brown, and indigenous tenants. 
I read the demand for rent cancellation as rebellion against the terms on which property and tenancy were established through settler colonialism and slavery. Inspired by Denise Ferreira de Silva, I think about rental debt as unpayable debt, a debt that exceeds the legitimacy of both the law, i.e. contract, and morality, i.e. obligation. What is at stake in such insurgency is an unraveling. I cannot yet call this decolonizing because it remains to be seen what happens to the colonial relationalities that undergird land, property, and rent. But I can assert that this is a reinscription of the relationship between sovereignty and property, between the state's police power and human life. The unraveling is also a remaking. In the struggles I've briefly outlined, it is a remaking of the very institution of property and the enclosures of land and life through which property is asserted. It is a remaking of public goods, not in the mold of the New Deal, but rather as what my friends and comrades at the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, Hannah Appel, calls reparative public goods. I would like to think that planning as a discipline and profession, as an institution, has a role to play in what Nicholas Blomley would call the unsettling of property and in the making of reparative public goods. I do not know as yet if such a role is forthcoming for the plans that are being made for the public stake in property, for rent cancellation, for unpayable debt come from insurgent movements especially those that planning seems to ignore or disavow. And so I leave you with a question to pose to the institutionality of planning, a question that comes from Walter Mignolo. Why would you want to save capitalism and not save human beings? Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Ananya, always an, always an inspirational. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Roberts. Uh, please, the floor, is, uh, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone from Bryan, Texas. Uh, I'll be speaking to you today uh, about historic preservation and particularly Black preservation practice as the tournament for those who are French and the tournament for the rest of us. Um, and like uh, Ananya, I'm uh, very hesitant to um, engage around uh, decolonialism um, as a metaphor and, and instead are very preoccupied with decolonial acts and decolonial strategies as they occur and as they naturally emerge. And that's what I'm going to speak to today, which is the question that resonated with me that was initially posed around the role planners should play in engaging the field's historical origins and identifying contextually suited interventions. And so my context or subfields are preservation and planning history, and I'll be speaking about issues situated um, in those subfields today. And so, of course, as, as most people know, I study historic African-American settlements known as freedom colonies, which are emerged from clusters of landowners who attain property through adverse possession, per purchase, squatting, and while so-called farmer relief in mass in the United States is imminent, access to small landowner, small landowners, people live in homesteads, uh, people who own less than 10 acres, uh, people in cities or on the edges of cities and historic black settlements, for many that money and that assistance will not be available. And this is important because African Americans rural areas in rural areas are often land rich, cash poor, and consistently vulnerable to dispossession due to the lack of access to things such as estate planning. For example, up to 75% of black land is held in testate. However, to access benefits of preservation, land ownership and building integrity are required. And as a result, we find that only 3% of all national register listings actually represent black heritage, 3%. And so, Freedom colonies, 
which I'll, I'll remind everyone are historic black settlements founded roughly between 1865 and 1930. Originally were founded in what we call bottom land or flood prone land because that was the land available to African-Americans at the time uh, near former plantations in many instances. And what really is the distinction to understand even though they're called freedom, freedmen's towns, black settlements, black towns, and they were anchored by churches, schools, and cemeteries is that they were founded out of intentionality and agency and not ne necessarily just where people were pushed to or ordered to live. Uh, in that one time, there were more than 557 of these places and I'll get to that number and the meaning of that number in a minute. But I first wanna talk about um, a gestured centered understanding of preservation in light of these facts and these people and these descendants uh, situated in this way. Jody Melamed aptly describes the organizing or agenda setting challenge racial capitalism I think presents to African-Americans and by extension practitioners committed to black centered planning and preservation of black places. He writes that quote, the degree to which ideologies of individualism, liberalism and democracy shaped by and shaping market economies and capitalist rationality from their mutual inception monopolize the terms of sociality despite their increasing hollowness, hollowness in the face of neoliberalism's predations. So many longstanding institutions or black relationality mediums survive, HBCUs, African-American businesses, social groups, and are now at the precipice of mediating and influencing resource distribution in all black communities through the influx of federal dollars. However, to what degree are these institutions propagating the relationality that Melamed describes? And how should preservationists facilitate a new black relationality beyond competition, scarcity, and white assimilation as frames of black landedness in historic space? Freedom colonies present a vehicle, I think, for understanding the tournament as a transformative frame for change in preservation. The tournament meaning diversion, detour, reroute and hijack or otherwise turning something aside from its normal course or purpose. For example, formerly enslaved African-Americans weren't included in the state's Homestead Act and Texas black codes blocked them from accessing public lands. For post reconstruction African-Americans, the unmediated access use and acquisition of the land in a context, absent procedures and legal validation of the right to settle was indeed a hijack. How should this inform our current practices then considering historic preservation's troubled relationship with black places and heritage values? And this is a text heavy slide. So to summarize on one column, you have what Laura Jane uh, Smith, a uh, critical heritage scholar calls authorized heritage or formal planning and heritage uh, regula regulations in the United States. And on the other side, you see descendants of historic black settlements in their frames for heritage values and planning practice. And essentially authorized heritage is associated then with rarity, scarcity, architectural fetish, architectural expertise, physical documentation, official documentation of place and telling borders and designations laden with requirements that African-American places cannot possibly adhere to, creating a preservation apartheid and inhibiting access to the benefits more than just the recognition or adoration, but the access to funding, to grants, uh, to certain protections and land use protections and designations. Whereas African-Americans uh, associated with these historic settlements find their documentation found in stories and memory and rituals, uh, in tenancy in common, their decision-making among griots and elders and kin keepers and their preservation standards enveloped in belief and cultural practice and memory and the cultural continuity and the sacred. Um, and so practitioners are in a position then to think about rerouting this languaging and this terminology and these frames uh, for preservation. And the intention um, or what I wanna talk about is the platforms that we can use to translate freedom colony heritage and relationality in ways that complicate cultural resource management and transportation planning in meaningful ways. And the attention behind this documenting and recognizing and preserving I talk about is to detect, is to detect situated decolonial acts 
or rerouting within preservation away from elitism, scarcity, and stratification. And this relationality recognizes African-Americans' unique positionality vis-a-vis -vis indigenous movements to repatriate land. Descendants of freedom colonies live in between and intersect with land colonial con coloniality and indigeneity, but are a distinct, powerful, untapped Black counterpublic that I think can, can facilitate the reworlding um, in the work of uh, Ananya, uh, can facilitate a reworlding of Black places and the construct of land and the construct of the historic. And so I'm going to share some examples of the tournament as it manifests among descendants, um, as well as uh, ways in which I've witnessed it manifest, I've documented it manifest in the way it's manifesting in my own work. Um, and then I'm going to end with the answer to the so what question, right? What difference do the stories, the maps, or the dialogue make? And so I'll conclude with some examples of the ways I think our methods have successfully contested the tyranny of place definition and historical status that have led to the destruction of Black places, cemeteries, and inclusion in planning processes. So I'll talk about a lot of this in the context of this region, uh, deep East Texas on the border of Louisiana, these two uh, areas of Jasper and Newton counties. And I'll speak first about a community associated uh, called Dixie Community in Jasper County, Texas. Jasper County with this notorious association with the dragging death of James Byrd. You can also see as a place with a large concentration of free black settlements. And so uh, I'm recounting a story that I first learned from a local um, a settle, a descendant of a settlement nearby who led me to the grave of Richard Dick Seal, who is adjacent to that of his captor in the middle of an African-American settlement settlement or cemetery. Uh, so when recounting Dick's life, um, the individual begins with his being taken under the slave master's wing, then his founding Dixie Baptist Church while still enslaved. And this story and this, this site figure prominently in local history and are told with a bias toward the White Seals family. William Seal, the former White House historian, uh, describes Richard Uncle Dick Seal as a trusted colleague of the Master Joshua. In William Seal's version, uh, we hear of Joshua Seal being permitted to receive tutoring. And his description of Dick's free status indicates a belief that his family's treatment of Richard Seal is what made him free. William Seal writes, my great grandfather Joshua was a tough man, but he loved Uncle Dick like one of the family. Conversely, Freedom Colony descendants, who you see here holding the This Place Matters sign, who've returned to this community have transformed the all black school in that community to a center for youth job enrichment and training and space for unions and quinceañeras and tie their community building philosophy and approach, not only to Richard Seal, but also to Bobby Seal, another descendant known for his approaches to liberation and community building. And so they've deterred <laughs> or hijacked the local history to sustain and cata catalyze a new relationality between land and space and historical significance. And more recently, they provided food and water after winter storm Uri uh, to the entire region. Freedom Colony founders, when they started these communities, founded um, or entered a world in which the notion of their agency was absurd. So we're used to hearing about determinant as being about situationalist and being absurd or even humorous. But uh, I don't mean to, to lighten the mood or to say this is about humor, or to say that, that instead the idea of Black colonization of space, uh, the fact that they felt entitled to space, was so ludicrous to whites that Freedom Colony locations remained invisible for some time and disappeared. Tours with descendants reveal landscape circulation patterns, their ancestors devised to territorialize freedom amidst unfreedom with a colonist confidence while simultaneously engaged in defensive placemaking to reroute racial violence away from their communities. However, once ownership was registered at courthouses, extra legal, legal and violent dispossession ensued and their cultural landscapes were erased from the legal and the public and the social record. Consequently, there are three challenges to finding, documenting, serving, working with these communities. Issues of visibility, the low population, de declining built environment, 
access, access to expertise and communities access to knowing what is accessible to them and vulnerability. And I mean that in the sense that there are valuable assets, valuable information that makes visible these places that is susceptible to loss um, due to legal precarity, financial precarity, and the information being in the minds of elders who will soon leave us. And uh, the reason for this demise, what happened to freedom colonies? Much of this is due to institutional racism, building integrity, dem demolition by neglect due to inability to access public funding, to access not just public funding, but banking, redlining. So we see this series of events of dispossession in several ways, which inhibit access to the benefits of historic preservation. And of course, these persistent challenges of land dispossession, municipal underbounding, disasters and hazards, preservation practice and policy with the land instability fundamentally inhibiting the access to these benefits, to these planning processes. And so the Texas Freedom Colonies Project started initially in 2014 has endeavored um, as an educational social justice initiative to support place preservation, not just the fetization of particular buildings or structures, but place preservation of black settlement heritage, the grassroots preservation practice and their placemaking history, their planning history. We do that through connecting and collecting, counter mapping and securing, and then co-creating engaged applied research in that process and as a consequence of that process. And what I wanna share with you really quickly then are uh, not just the way that we do the work writ large, but our, our flagship project, project, the Texas Freedom Colonies Atlas, which is the first statewide effort to integrate the synods into contemporary planning processes by making previously unrecorded place knowledge available to practitioners involved in infrastructure environmental review of publicly funded projects in order to overcome the perception of placelessness for those concerned about the vulnerability of making such information visible, consider that the invisibility did not save them. It simply added to the vulnerability and they're being excised from planning processes as gro growth expanded into the areas that were once remote. So the project doesn't merely aggregate public data, but it fills absences. And as Rupika Rassam writes, it intervenes in the public record by quote, fostering the production of the multiple epistemologies for digital knowledge production needed to ensure inclusion in the digital record and in the case of preservation, the preservation record. So why an atlas? To make the stories of origin and claim to place visible, to geotag and spatialize it, increase visibility, increase agency, and, and make visible historical significance. And I just wanna share really quickly the features uh, people can add to the map, they can search on the map, and uh, they can look at the intersections of planning activity and risk with these settlements that were heretofore not visible on the map, such as historic, uh, such as Hurricane Harvey rather, and TxDOT, or transportation planning projects that are occurring presently or in the next five years. And most recently, we've made it user-friendly, meaning increase the availability of images, uh, the availability of stories in more accessible ways. And most importantly, uh, we've been able to learn from these stories, as I said, fill the gaps in the record. Uh, the gaps in the record, meaning the names of places, of people, of structures, of leaders, and the experience of these places as Black joy and not Black precarity and Black death another way in which the stories in, the, in our conception of these places are being rerouted. And finally, I wanna to speak to our nearest, um, our most recent um, efforts uh, around uh, relationality, and that is to sustain relation, relationality or increase it or foster it in a new way in a COVID not dominated world. We've introduced a talk show so that we can help African-American settlement descendants connect even in the face of the pandemic. Uh, we had an individual, for example, share about the pandemic's impact on black funerals and mourning and grieving and the access to capital needed to survive. 
And so I'd like to just conclude by saying that uh, determinant or rerouting emerges in descendants' practices, stories, language, relationality, and engagement. Placemaking, keeping, and remembrance of preservation foster, I think, the potential for new relationality between governance and heritage and space and land that can encompass more than just retention, wealth, accumulation, but instead seek new communal Black relationality. However, we encounter challenges in the work as many devalued their memories, doubted the veracity of their stories, and embraced Black exceptional, exceptionalism that overshadowed opportunities to collaborate or connect. And so engage dialogue, increase communication pathways for interruption, such as a more robust Section 106 consultation process in public projects, and unpacking of internalized racism must be faced to transform preservation and make planning history. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roberts. This is, thank you for all the work you do. It's also fascinating, inspirational. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Yaftakhal, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Very exciting uh, to be here. Um, it's a wonderful gathering and a wonderful opportunity to uh, share our critical perspectives, argue about them, sharpen them, and hopefully uh, improve them. Um, I'll share my screen. And I begin again with the uh, thank you for the uh, organizers. Shukran Jazelan and uh, Shalom from Israel, Palestine. My talk actually does take seriously the challenge that you presented us, uh, Hiba. And I'm looking at uh, the uh, planning and the uh, new metropolis, whether we dare to decolonize. And of course, I share with the previous speakers and also the wonderful first panel, the incredible challenges and obstacles and the ideal of decolonize. But nonetheless, it's a movement, it's an activism, it's a frame of mind that I want to challenge. And I put a picture here of uh, Dubai, one of the uh, model cities of the 21st century, on which I will elaborate in a minute, just in case people wonder. This is uh, Burj Al Arab. This is not the biggest uh, uh, tower in, in Dubai. It's only the second biggest. And you'll see later on um, how, we, how we treat uh, this case, this model case of Dubai. So I think encountering uh, present colonialities is the contemporary challenge for planning. This is already answering uh, one of the questions that you posed. And it goes in various forms, of course. It's a project for generations. But nonetheless, first of all, it needs to be exposed, articulated, uh, uh, because uh, the common knowledge is that, that we are in a post-colonial era. Uh, and uh, let me try and unpack this kind of statement. So, I'll start with three paradigms, three paradigms of urban colonialities that will just act as small windows to the, uh, to the issue. Uh, one of them is in Tallinn, Estonia. The other one is Beersheba, right here outside my window, uh, and uh, in Dubai. And I want to first uh, emphasize the um, perspective, which is not from the Northwest. Uh, so far, we've heard a lot of scholars, uh, but the focus was the United States, fair enough. But let's try and learn from other regions, other logics. Uh, and of course, uh, the perspective from there allows us to see other movements and powers. Um, and the three trajectories are all in situations of urban colonialities, but leading in different ways. And I think that's something that we can and pinpoint our understanding how planning is involved in that. First of all, Tallinn, not a very well-known city. In fact, all the three cities that I chose are not sort of central cities. They are not capitals, but still they are kind of models. So Tallinn was uh, an ethnocratic city in the 1990s in the post a Soviet colonial era when it sort of uh, managed to get its independence, uh, Estonia. And it very much annihilated the uh, existence of the Russian culture, the Russian planning, all the Soviet legacy. But nonetheless, half the population of Tallinn the city remained as Russian. They were denied citizenship. They were colonized by the new Estonian state. And um, 
in recent years, through plans, through other influences uh, like uh, human rights organizations, the European unions, uh, the new plans for uh, Tallinn are moving from ethnocratic to more inclusive, uh, more equal, uh, yet not totally decolonized because many of the Russians still don't have citizenship, but they are acquiring it and they have urban citizenship. Um, the city was sharply divided before. You see on the left, the typical Soviet uh, housing uh, and the new plan for, the master plan for, for Tallinn is very much focused on trying to integrate this kind of enclaves into a more unified or integrated society. This is the new plan. It has all the buzzwords. Of course, it's a little bit of jargon, sustainability, equality, inclusion, multiculturalism. But on the ground, what I find in, uh, is that there's slow progress in recent years towards decolonizing what was sharply colonial relations of, uh, of two groups. Now we move to Beersheba. We see another uh, trajectory, which is a persistence of settler colonial uh, immigrant city. And uh, like I uh, mentioned before, we're actually sitting on tribal land of Bedouins for centuries, maybe more than a millennium. Um, and uh, this is a typical kind of contrast between the indigenous informal gray space, criminalized uh, town around Beersheba and the city, the more organized Jewish city that you can see at the background. Um, you can see here a manifestation, unlike the, the Tallinn plan, a total exclusion. You see the map on the right is the metropolitan plan for Beersheba, which was approved about six or seven years ago, uh, which has a lot of agricultural um, reserves. Uh, the, all the green areas of various land uses and the Bedouin indigenous populations are supposed to urbanize into these towns. On the left, you see the actual, uh, you know, mapping of, of the aerial photos of the area. And you see how many people, more than 100,000 people are what they call unrecognized communities, that like in, invisible. So this is an ongoing settler colonial relation, urbanizing as it is around a metropolis, but nonetheless, uh, uh, a very different trajectory. Uh, and uh, the sites on the ground, there is constant state violence, uh, unprecedented level of uh, house demolition in, in recent years. This is a graph that is, you know, shooting through the uh, ceiling. Uh, there's more than 2000 house demolitions every year in the last five or six years with the, you know, the rise of nationalist uh, uh, government in Israel. Uh, you see the stats here on the right. And you also see the comparison of uh, what Jews in the region experience, uh, which is about 10% the number of um, House demolition that is among the, the Bedouin Arabs. Uh, so there is definitely an ongoing uh, spatial colonialism trying to force the indigenous uh, Bedouin Arabs into towns. But it's, it does connect to a greater picture, I said, and uh, I was very glad that Mona Fawaz was talking about the state as well, because as urbanists, sometimes we tend to forget that there is a power structure of the state. Uh, and uh, this is a recent report that I was co-author of uh, from B'Tselem, as was already mentioned, and it created a lot of echoes around the world, was published in January, about the apartheid regime in general, which is an attempt to stabilize colonial relations, to actually formalize them in terms of uh, different statuses to different populations. This is what's happening now in Israel, Palestine, and the recent scandals of the vaccine apartheid, that you know, Israel is very fast uh, to, to vaccinate its population but not allowing or not uh, providing the Palestinians under the control uh, uh, with, with vaccination, just another man manifestation, but our report is dealing more with immigration and with land and with the management of violence. Uh, these are three recent books and, uh, that, uh, that I authored and uh, it's not really in terms of uh, trying to promote them, but in terms of the languages. And uh, one is in English, Empty Lands. The other one, Otsma Vadama, is in Hebrew. And here, Al Arad Mufrara is in Arabic. And I want to, to sort of project that one of the decolonizing practices is also writing in local languages, passing the knowledge to local communities, which in academia is, uh, is quite rare because English is the only language of, of capital, if you like. Um, now we move to the third window, which is Dubai. <laughs> 
and uh, Dubai is, uh, you know, a stark uh, type of new urban colonialities, colonial relation, which is not as the old colonial relation, a state or uh, an empire moving out, expanding, subjugating people, colonizing them, grabbing the land. But in this current era, we see the dispossessed, the subaltern, actually like magnets coming and subjugating themselves to the powers that be. But nonetheless, the relations remain uh, colonial relations. This is why I call it urban colonial coloniality and not urban colonialism, because it's a different geographical setting, it's inverse geographical setting. But yet the relationship of separation, hierarchy, segregation, exploitation, and most importantly, essentialization, you are marked as different, it, like in the colonial era, but now in the city, and it's stark in Beersheba, and it's very stark in Dubai, against this glory of Dubai, uh, uh, you have this stat, you see that Dubai is the highest number of non-citizens in the city. This was in 2016, but now it's actually almost 90% of the people are not even citizens. Like Hannah Arendt famously said, they don't have the right to ask for rights. Uh, and this is maybe a model for the future of urban coloniality. Uh, and this is, I analyzed the planning of Dubai, of course, a new friend of Israel now. Uh, it has different uh, regions for different populations. The outline plan, the master plan for 2020, actually, like in the South African, uh, and, and to some extent, like in the Israeli case, actually allocates different areas to different populations, like national residential, temporary residentials, workers' residentials, et cetera, et cetera. It's an apartheid city, which of course is very connected to the coloniality of relations. Uh, and then, of course, there is the dark side of it, uh, as this article shows, no rights to the worker, no right to family, no right to land, to housing. The, the, the workers in, 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 in the vast majority of the population, there is disposable, displaceable, uh, evictable, uh, and it's a height of exploitation and marginalization. So this is important, uh, I'm knowing that I'm writing and uh, running out of time, but it's important to flag these three models, also because Dubai is also is a fantasy. Uh, this is a recent uh, Guardian article about Addis Ababa with a famous prime minister, you know, the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, uh, saying that now Dubai is our model in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and around the world, or Singapore, which is another example where many people have no rights in Singapore, etc. So let's think about these three models, Tallinn in, in this sort of trying to decolonize the relation there. Uh, Beersheba is a status quo of, of colonial relation and Dubai is a new coloniality uh, that uh, you know, is emerging around the world. Um, how much more time do I have, Hiba? Uh, you're almost done. <laughs> I'm almost done. Okay, so what I want to emphasize is three or four more points um, while you have the picture of, of Dubai. Um, there is um, uh, various uh, possibilities to look at this. And I want to emphasize uh, the uh, perspective of the global Southeast. And I know Vanessa Watson will talk after me and elaborate on it, but I think uh, there's a great range of scholars and perspectives that actually we can see better those kind of, 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 uh, of dynamics uh, that exist uh, from our regions, of course, they apply to the rest of the world, but it sharpens our ability to see. And, and uh, I draw Annabel, uh, Annabel uh, Cochino and uh, Walter Minoglo, as we already said. And uh, another point that we have to emphasize through this gaze is that coloniality is not only North versus South, it's on, not only white versus the other color. Coloniality is also South versus South and East versus East. Uh, so uh, we have to look at it as, as uh, the South colonizing the South in many uh, ways that weren't really imagined before. Ashila members famously talk about the pathologies of, of, of new sovereignties. So I think in planning terms, we also have to go beyond uh, while of course maintaining the uh, frameworks of, of European and white uh, colonization, we have to go beyond that and look at uh, and how planning is exercised on the ground. And I want to finish with decolonization, uh, which is uh, two more slides, Hiba. Uh, 
Um, how we look at it very briefly, a vocabulary that a lot of people would know, um, you know, the voice to the people, it sounds banal, but we have an extreme regime of silencing, including, of course, uh, people like me that, uh, you know, people attempt to silence quite often. Uh, I am in a privileged position, but the people that suffer from those demolitions, et cetera, are very, very much silenced. Fair rise from the Southeast, we already talked about. New vocabularies among great scholars, many of them speak here today, we have to adopt them. And um, I would say that transformative planning is activism. We have to get out of the comfort zone of writing papers and being the academia and actually go work with communities, present them in committees, in the courts, in politics. Uh, and decolonial, decolonial planning is also beyond discourse. It's actually doing things. Education, practices uh, 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 that I don't have to elaborate too much, but also the vision of equal metros and chic. We have to find a new normative uh, flag on which to reimagine the way power is now reconstructed in, in cities. And since my time is uh, almost over, uh, I want to uh, connect to the idea that rage is impossible, professional rage to salvage the transformative power of planning, which has transformative power, but it's been also abused. And um, to finalize with this kind of idea that maybe decolonial planning is captured by the word dare, but I read dare from right to left, which is, you know, just to go against the grain of power. So it's equalize, it's resist or refuse the power advocate alternatives and decolonize. And this is captured in this kind of picture of Dubai upside down. Maybe this is a vision for us as decolonizing planners and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aran. Um, thank you for, uh, for always illuminating and bringing up new concepts to think with you. Um, mm -hmm. Next we have uh, Professor Watson, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hiva and uh... Yeah, thanks again for the invitation and putting together this wonderful series of panels. I, I don't have slides, which is probably a good thing since my screen is looking very strange. So I'm just going to talk. And I really want to make one single argument in, in what I'm going to say. And that is to emphasize my belief in the importance of taking place and context into account in relation to all planning concepts and practices. And in this case, the concepts of post-colonial and decolonial planning. So I really welcome the way this session has been framed, which asks for future directions, for socially just, but also contextually situated interventions. So, so well done, I think, on, a, on an excellent framing of these panels. So for some years, I have aligned myself with what has been called Southern or Southeast planning, the theoretical project, along with Oren and, and many others uh, in the session, sessions today. It's a position that emerged in response to, and as a critique of, the historical tendencies to produce planning theories and practices based on undeclared assumptions about context, about the nature of economy, society, culture, environment, and cities, and to assume these could be universalized to all parts of the world. And many of you will be very familiar with this line of argument. But as a Southern or Southeast planning theorist, my thinking does have much in common with those strands of ideas termed decolonial, postcolonial, neocolonial, or settler colonial planning. Many parts of the global Southeast have histories and presence shaped in very different ways by colonization as well as systems of planning, land use and settlement inherited and shaped 
through processes of colonization. And we have heard much about that today. And yet I prefer to remain under the Southeast theorizing label, as I think it allows me to consider forces and factors which include, but which are also in addition to processes of colonization. I'm going to turn briefly to the South African case to make some points about this. But firstly, I just want to note how important it is to me that concepts of decolonial, postcolonial, and abolitionist planning have attracted this kind of interest in parts of the global north. It's inspired the conference today. In the US particularly, planning has a very long and conservative history with many of the usual knowledge gatekeepers resistant to the ideas of alternative ways of seeing and thinking about planning. I sense fertile ground is emerging now for growing interest and development in this area of planning theory. And there's great potential for Southern collaborations. But having said that, I want to sound a note of caution. And it has to do with the acknowledgement of context and difference. I am very wary of the tendency of good ideas to uncritically leapfrog from their place of origin to very different places where they have different meanings and different implications. And I suspect this is already happening in the decol decolonization debates. Recently, a colleague of mine from Ghana teaching in the US, and I use the story with his permission, wrote to me to say that he felt the pressure to consider that his country had to be recolonized by important discourses on decolonialism before it could be decolonized all over again with new terminology and ideas from elsewhere. And this is very worrying. Place and context is key, is important. So let me turn to the context of South Africa to make some points about this question of difference. As many of you will know, South Africa under the apartheid government has been held up as an extreme example of the most vicious and devastating laws and plans aimed at racial segregation and racial repression in cities and the countryside. A minority white population, 12% of the total, maintained political and economic control over the 88% of the rest of the population, black, and 90% of the land which lay outside the Bantustans reserves. Planning, which was largely inherited from British colonial rule, was a central tool in enforcing this apartheid. Cities and towns were deeply and spatially inscribed with race and class divisions. In 1994, 27 years ago, democracy was secured and formal political power passed to the African National Congress. The liberation movement founded on the Freedom Charter, reflecting a commitment to equal rights for all. Our 1996 constitution was recognized as one of the most progressive in the world. Dismantling spatial apartheid and moving to integrated, equitable, and sustainable post-apartheid cities was an early goal. Cities and towns produced planning frameworks showing exactly this. All levels of the state appeared committed to it, as was the planning profession. But 27 years on, why has so little of this happened? Why do our cities not look terribly different from what they did in 1994? 
The ANC still has power. The white population has shrunk to 8%. Now, in part, what this shows is the difficulty of reversing the impacts of colonization and apartheid in our field of planning and urban settlements. The materiality of cities means that history, any history, is deeply inscribed and hard to change. In South Africa, planning laws and approaches were a colonial inheritance. But those planning laws were not changed until 20 years after the end of apartheid. And then many of the earlier and inherited planning principles, such as private ownership of property and land use zoning and so on, are unchanged. There are a number of other factors beyond the lasting impacts of colonization and apartheid, which have made it particularly hard to undo the inequalities and divides of South Africa's cities. These take on very specific form in this country and even in each city, making South Africa very different to other countries on the continent and even in the global South and reinforcing my point that place and context are key. Very briefly, the impact of the sudden opening after 1994 of South, Afri South Africa's economy to globalization and the ongoing influence of an unconstrained private sector property market has meant that class and income divides have simply reinforced earlier racial divides. The growing black middle, black middle and working class has meant that some formerly white suburbs have desegregated in some cities. But essentially, the class divides remain. A land restitution process was put in place after 1994, allowing people to claim back their land. It has been glacially slow. Recently, Expropriation without compensation has been allowed. We will see what that does. And in the meantime, the poorest of our urban populations, also black, have further concentrated on the edges of cities in post-apartheid state-provided housing. This land is the cheapest. While swathes of well-located, state-owned, empty land remain undeveloped in cities for the poor. This is a failure of post-apartheid planning, of, of post-apartheid government and a failure of planning. So colonization and apartheid left the democratic government of South Africa with deeply divided and exclusionary cities, underpinned by a similarly problematic planning system. But it is insufficient to suggest that decolonization of these forms and processes is all that is required in this context. Given government commitment post-1994 to a just, non-racial, and equal future for all, free of the shackles of apartheid, a change must be possible. But in thinking about planning and the post-colony of South Africa, I want to align myself with the position of Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe, rather than the decoloniality arguments of the Latin American school and Walter Mignolo, which of course is entirely appropriate and that, in that context. And of course, these are ideas which are brilliant and inspirational but they are different and probably also different to the concerns of decolonial scholars in the United States and perhaps this is a subject for further discussion. Mignola's decolon decoloniality embraces indigenous modes of thinking and rejects those Western expressions of modernity imposed on much of the world through colonialism and empire. Hence, for him, 
decoloniality is not a successor to colonialism and coloniality. Rather, it offers an alternative, one that is rooted in indigenous thought and practice about nature, community, and solidarity. Very differently, Mbembe questions our ability to cut free of modernity. In a far more dialectical, relational, and entangled picture of the relations between colonist and colonizer, he sees the future of Africa and the world that Africa reveals and exemplifies as lying in a renewed effort to enact a more inclusive, sustainable, and equitable vision of reason and humanity than was globally normalized in the past five centuries. Accepting that the European imperial project has devalued and displaced other more emancipatory ways of thinking, Mbembe explores a future that is grounded in the African experience of diaspora and mobility. It is these processes of mixture, flow and interaction that help Africa define a path towards decolonization that does not rest heavily on the platform of indigeneity. These experiences, he insists, open the path to Afropolitanism, a politics that uses both the history and present of Africa to think about global emancipation. He argues that Africa is a continent rich in resources and epistemologies and new modes of political association, and that its openness to the global circulation of ideas, people, cultures, and goods. In this, we can find an alternate modernity to the one we live in now. The politics of extremity, that colonial, the politics of extremity, that colonial projects and subjects find themselves in, he suggests, has created new sites for invention and imagination producing zones of hybridity in which the civilizing project of the colonial master inadvertently produces new spaces of dialogue and creativity. The emergence of a vast world of rich ideas, thought forms, linguistic styles, and technologies of the self in Francophone Africa is for Mbembe thus a paradoxical fruit of colonialism and the zones of hybridity it produced. So Mbembe speaks to the reality of Francophone Africa here, but there is a broad position that can be explored in relation to the post-colonies such as South Africa. And I believe this concept of, of the Creole, of the hybrid is important. It's about mix it's of the old and the new, of appropriation, of what is valuable from the past and the present here. In planning here, in the con context of South Africa, what this then requires is a deep understanding of context, of how people are refashioning the city from the bottom up, how they survive in spite of, and not as a result of planning and state services provision. There is an important role for the state, as was raised in the first panel, and in part to interact with the market. Like Ananya, I identify the market, the property sector, as a key obstacle to progress in, in changing our cities. So to interact with the market in a much stronger way, but also to be persuaded to seek new and innovative approaches to infrastructure provision, sanitation, water, power, transport, creating circular urban metabolisms rather than linear ones, integrating state provision with community forms of provision to create innovative hybrids. Of course, political commitment is key, as well as a radically revised planning law and questions of the commodification of land. 
Now, I've done very little here to lay out any kind of new approach to planning in South Africa or elsewhere. But the point I have been trying to make is that different starting points in post-colonial or decolonial planning when considering the post-colony can take one down very different routes to rethinking planning. And that both starting points and the roads followed are shaped by context. South Africa is very different from the rest of Africa and very different again from the US or Europe. But I want to close with a quote from a recent paper on decolonizing African studies in the global North where the author wrote, an intellectually decolonized Africa can only be one in which the continent holds a central place and which defines the questions to be asked and the answers to be sought in terms that are clearly rooted in Africa itself. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, for amazing food for, for thought and for the weaving together all the conversation we've been having. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of questions coming up. And thank you for everyone, of course, again. Uh, so we have a lot of questions coming up from the audience. Um, uh, I'll try to go um, in order and maybe combine a couple of them. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, basically go mostly for the questions that, are, um, that address most, uh, all of you. So uh, I will start with the first question that uh, comes from Muhammad Ali Sharif that uh, and combine it with a question that comes from Deepak uh, Lambanivs. So the first one is the case for the hill stations of um, the case for the hill stations of, Oteli, uh, of Uti and Darjeeling in India are perfect examples of land grab. The British established large tea estates by clearing forest lands and denying the tribals the rights to forests and its resources. Uh, today, 75 years after independence, these tea, tea estates now owned by corporate entities continue to engage the, in the production of tea for export to the UK and other uh, parts of the world, while the tribals remain dispossessed of their rights and their hereditary ways of life. These tribals are offered food rations and sometimes housing as social welfare schemes of government which smack for charity work. How can the hill tribes secure back access to the forest and their lives and their dignity? So basically the uh, follow-up question, how can planners and governments undo centuries of injustice? Relatedly, Deepak asked about, uh, um, he would extend Ananya's uh, analysis uh, to Puerto Rico, a colony of the United States, to decipher which kinds of insurgent planning practices can help catalyze a transformative decolonizing agenda at a moment when imperial powers and designs have captured the emergency moment to advance a land grab and dispossession strategy. We have several inspiring examples, but the issue of scale and asymmetrical power relations in an outright imperial domination relationship seem unsurmountable. Are the master's tools sufficient to bring his house down? Is it truly really possible to plan a decolonial transformation from within this colonial context? So it's basically, in, 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 in a nutshell, how can planners and governments undo centuries of injustice? And can the master's tools, uh, are they sufficient to bring the, the, the house down? I'll get us started. Um, these are huge questions. I was just watching the expression on Andrea's face as the questions <laughs> rolled out, right? Um, so I think, you know, I think the, the ways in which the questions are framed make a couple of points that I think we as panelists made that of course land grabs and these colonial relationalities are not a thing of the past. They are active and present. And this is why uh, so many of us are drawn to the idea of the post colony, as Vanessa reminded us, rather than um, to th that while decolonial freedom might be on the horizon, um, I think that these post colonial logics and these post colonial forms of rule are alive and well in reproducing and even making new colonial relationalities. So the examples of the plantations, the tea plantations of India and of Puerto Rico can be added on to the examples, for example, that Oren gave us, right? As instantiations of these colonial relationalities. I think with both, I'm especially interested in sort of the legal apparatus that keeps in place these forms of power. So it is not at all surprising, right, that land acquisition laws and the legal apparatus that enables extraction in India, especially the extraction 
of, um, of natural resources, um, continue British systems of lawmaking and space making, right? So I'm also very interested then in those continuities and what it would mean to disrupt those continuities. I do think that in fact, um, these, these remade, renewed colonial relationalities require, uh, can only be undone through um, freedom struggles. I, you know, I think that Deepak in his question suggested that already, that the master's tools will not suffice for that unraveling. But um, I, I think therefore that this moment of emergency that Deepak also referenced is a complex one, that at least in um, this hemisphere, in the North American context, it is clear that emergency urbanism is a time of renewed crisis and land grabs, but it is also a time of uprising. And I am very interested in that uprising, though I, as I noted at the end of my talk, I think planning as an institutionalized form of knowledge making and space making likes to disavow in the North American context, such uprising. We see it as completely outside of legitimate ways of knowledge making and space making. Um, and we participate, I think, in the, even the criminalization of such uprising. But I think that remaking that relationship between sovereignty and property, which is at stake in both these questions, can, take, can only take place not through the institutionality of things like planning, but through uprising. And yeah, Vanessa, Ryan. Hi. Um, you know, I think, I think the South African example is an interesting one. It, it was really as, as a result of struggle over, over many decades that a democratic government came into power and established a land restitution process through which people could approach a court and claim back their land. The restitution court was funded and allowed government to buy land to give back to people. It's an interesting example and we have to ask why, why has it, why has it not really worked? Why has it been so slow? What we have to point to again, <laughs> and then yet, is the commodification of land and the property market. It has simply not been possible for state to sufficiently fund the restitution process to, to get land back to people quickly enough. So the institution is there, the intention is there. What is blocking it? Uh, it's, it's, back to, it's back to property and it's back to commodification of land. But it's possible. Uh, Andrea, do you want to go? You know, I just wanted to say really quickly that when I think about this in the American context, and it somewhat had to do with what Ananya was saying about criminalization, is that this is when I think about what works or what has potential is abolitionist planning, that frame, because the criminalization piece, there's not just the monetization of land, there's the monetization of people and bodies. And abolitionist planning and planners um, have an opportunity and have looked at ways in which we can decriminalize, we can shift large budgets uh, away from policing. And while this is a different, it's a somewhat different answer, a different question when you're talking about what has the possibility and what is born fruit, especially in this context, I think it's when that's when the shift to the abolitionist frame for planners becomes something tangible and viable um, in terms of some kind of progress. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I also think it's a, you know, it's a million dollar question. Um, but I see planning, like most uh, policy areas and um, endeavors of uh, collective organization, as a field of struggle. And it's a field of struggle. We have uh, particular um, negotiation struggles and uh, demonstrations. And what are the tools in our toolkit? One of the tools in our toolkit is a conceptualization, is how we actually articulate the situation. 
Uh, I recently wrote an article about vertical versus horizontal terminology. What is the landscape of our articulation? Now, as critical scholars and activists, I think we have to imbue uh, the, the work of power into the terms. And I think uh, the coloniality of planning actually does that. It, it highlights uh, the idea that colonial type relations, right, of expansion, domination, exploitation, and essentialization, keeping you together and apart all the time. You're part of the same system, but you are lower in your status. I think this is, uh, 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 this, this is one of the tools that we have is to articulate it, and then of course to struggle against it with our students, with our communities, with the all kinds of uh, possibilities that exist. And let's not forget that colonialism is illegal. It's a crime, it's a crime against humanity if we talk about international law. Now we have to import that to the city. And this is why I want to ask Vanessa, for example, I mean, you, you talk about a liberal state, but I was talking about urban citizenship. Urban citizenship translates nowadays in the 21st century, sometimes more importantly than state citizenship. And inside cities, in particular metro areas, you can have colonial type relation. Well, it's, a, it's not colonialism, but coloniality of the powers that, that keep millions of people in the Mitchell Plains without uh, proper planning, without proper facilities, with the uh, danger, constant danger of being evicted, right? So I wasn't quite sure why, uh, you know, uh, was the uh, aversion of using this kind of terms. Well, of course, it's not alone. We're talking about a multitude of, of factors, but I think uh, uh, there, it is a good discourse to uh, highlight the oppression that exists in planning and to challenge the planners that on the face of it, of course, are all committed like to equality, prosperity, equity. So this is our role, I think, to highlight it, to expose it and to struggle against it. Thank you so much. Uh, there are another set of questions from uh, Janice Berry and a couple other that I, th I think we can, uh, basically there, it's, uh, and I read the part from Janice Berry, but also speaks to other, to other questions. Um, she's wondering if the panelists might reflect further on what decolonization demands of planning theory and what more work we need to do in terms of pulling out differences between settler colonialism, new colonialism, post-colonialism, et cetera, just some of what uh, the terms uh, Vanessa Watson used in her comments. Uh, and to think about context. And so do we need to be careful about using the term decolonization too broadly? And I, th I think it's interesting because each one of you have a different stand about what, and I think it points to the, uh, to the fact that we don't have a, a one definition, which is good, of what it de decolonial mean or decolonizing mean. And I think each one of you have a different stand about what decolonial mean. And I think that speaks, maybe these questions are speaking and asking you maybe to uh, more expand on that, uh, the differences and maybe what we're looking for when we talk about that if we mm -hmm. want to look for the colonial planning. Well, since I was last, I'll start. And <laughs> I think, you know, with, with realism and with the Southeastern perspective, and I totally join uh, Vanessa with, with the idea that this is important. This is, of course, the vast majority of the world. The West that produces most of the knowledge is maybe it's less than a fifth of the world. Let's remember where we are. We are the majority, right? But from there also come different perspectives, um, different cosmologies, if you like. One of them is um, uh, an, uh, the, the very idea that the, there is no horizon. There is no redemption. The, the life for generation is a struggle, just like in Lubnan. So, uh, of course, we hope for better, but to decolonize is a process. We're not talking about anymore in, in, in Levin. <laughs> We're lost. <laughs> but you, you know, there is the, the experience of generations is so much so uh, that uh, uh, it, it's a very Western or Northern perspective, you know, that you can actually reach a solution, that you actually can reach some kind of, of, of an ideal of a utopia uh, uh, in the everyday, in the shades of gray of life. I think uh, decolonizing is. A project, it's a project that will never be complete because there will always be new colonizations. I had one slide that I didn't have time to, to show as usual, I'll sneak it in the Q and A's. It was about the digital world. Now the digital world now is colonizing us in various ways, unpredicted uh, previously, uh, incredibly powerful cooperation. They can even silence the president of the United States, right? Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> 
Now, what does that do to the relation between the various groups in the city, you know, in terms of literacy, technology, surveillance, data is the new. So what I'm, th what I'm saying that not to uh, glorify the, the digital world is that there will constantly be new frontiers. And as planners, we really have to think about equality, radical equality, collective and individual. It's, equality is not always simple which of course will include restitution and compensation for, for damage uh, suffered, but, but also as a horizon, it, total equality is a constant project of decolonizing the relations. Anyone wants to add? Yeah. I, I think I wanna to speak to the students out there as yeah. I answer this question, yeah. because I, I have interesting conversations with them about their careers, for example. And so as we talk about what planners are capable of doing and how they're supposed to be thinking and acting in a de decolonial way and what does it all mean, for a lot of them, they don't anticipate necessarily going into work in a system to necessarily go and work in a government. And I'm wondering how much we are preparing people, these young people who are going out into planning, ready to change the world, who don't anticipate that that means I have to go and change an institution. And I think that's part of the decolonizing um, I know we're talking about systems. One of the systems I'm talking about is planning education here, is how well we're equipping people to go out with this thinking and build new apparatus, a new apparatus for planning in a decolonial way, new vehicles, even outside the nonprofit industrial complex, like how are we doing that? So that's just sort of coming to mind as we're talking about what can you do if you are a planner and you work for the state? Even though I know that's not always the assumption, but that's pretty baked into what we're talking about here. And so um, I would say that we have some serious things to consider in planning education um, around how much we're preparing people to, you know, pass the AICP and then go out there and have this career, and then how much we're also preparing them to tear things down. <laughs> um, and some of us do that very well. Uh, some of them are on this panel <laughs> in terms of preparing people to go out and build new things and do things in new ways. But I think that's a big part of our conversation here we have to attend to um, wherever we are. Yes, I'm sure um, Ananya and Vanessa and Aaron have a lot to say about planning education because they're all involved in different ways of activism at the intersection of education and practice. I mean, I think that's a really important conversation. Maybe we'll get to have a bit of it. Um, and I wanted to also um, address the question that Janice Barry posted in the Q&A. I mean, so I do think there's a conversation to be had around what do we mean by planning and what are the planning futures for which we are educating our students? And I would say that I am struck in the US context by the proximity that even our outside the system planners have or must have to state power, right? So that is very striking to me, and even outside the nonprofit industrial complex, right? So I uh, think that that piece of it, um, and here um, paying attention to what Vanessa noted, that these are very specific forms of deep difference, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that is a conversation to be had. I like to teach the history of Anglo-American planning as one rooted in the settling and making of property, right? But also one that has always had um, an anarchist history that has always in fact thought about property as theft. Um, and that is perhaps a useful way in which to read something like even Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities. But as I said, that's a whole, that's a whole nother discussion, right? About how do we tell a different history of planning. I, I worry, of course, about yoking the term decolonizing to the term planning, and Heba already knows this. Um, I worry because more broadly, particularly indigenous studies scholars have expressed great concern about the way in which the term decolonizing is now in circulation, especially in North America. Right? And the ways in which that term runs the risk then of whitewashing um, quite violent ongoing relationships of land grab, 
So one example of this is that our universities, which are land grab universities, um, have, have sort of streamlined such things as land acknowledgement, special advisor to the chancellor on indigenous affairs, et cetera, et cetera, while refusing to consider in any way land repatriation or reparations. In fact, the conversation around land reparations or repatriation seems impossible in established planning circles, right? So when, when you know, I, I think there have been similar conversations around abolitionist planning. Um, on my mind is the very powerful critique of abolitionist planning penned by Dichonet Dozier, who, you know, whose piece was titled, There is no room for planners in the movement for abolition, arguing that planning has been a circuitry of colonial and capitalist extraction. Planners suddenly can't claim to be abolitionists. I know that's not the kind of abolition planning that Andrea is talking about, right? And I think Duchesne made the argument um, about insurgent planners and their role. But I do think that planning, like any other form of institutionality, likes to appropriate criticality and make it its own, right? And I think that's what I want to push against. Um, so that if we are to think about decolonizing planning, it's not just about the decolonizing of knowledge, it's not just about the use of a different language, it is about undoing the land property, propertization relationships that have made this settler, slaveholder, imperial democracy that is the US. I'm if I might interject here with a, with a question that has been on my mind, it's not fully formulated, but it's about the, the decoupling of property from, from planning and the implication. Like first, how can you decouple property from planning? But the second is about, I, I'm all for like, like abolishing our free thinking property, but from, from, from this space where I'm talking to today, from today. But at the same time, I'm wondering about all the Palestinians and the uh, black families that Andrea was talking about that are actually, they are very much wanting for the property to legitimate and to rethink about how they were dispossessed and to re to be to for equal distribution redistribution of wealth for reparation for etc so how can you tell people i mean that's why I, I think this is a great conversation because you cannot generalize because while here the capitalization the real estate the dispossession the land grab uh, requires us to decoup decouple property from any kind of social justice initiatives. I think in other places of the world, like for example, Palestinians living under the state of Israel would argue differently for property. They still hold the keys wherever they go uh, decades after they have left or black families who have been gentrified or indigenous people who had been dispossessed. And so I wonder if you can just briefly talk to this question that I always, when I talk to my uh, students about like property is at the heart of our problems, but then at the same time, I think about all the other people who are holding the keys in different parts of the world, yearning for that property that they will expel on under all sorts of colonial um, uh, institutions. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up here, because that's essentially, you know, what I was wrestling or beginning to wrestle with within a 15 minute period, which is the question of property for African Americans and how intertwined the idea of owning property is about owning oneself, because we were property. Uh, and so it becomes a very um, different set of questions that again are reflected very well in the abolitionist conversation about owning oneself and, and not being criminalized. Um, but the decolonial question is very complicated. And I guess what I'm looking for, or what I'm exploring in my talk is this new relationality with land or reclaiming the aspects of relationality we have with land and self-governance in a way that doesn't merely mimic the colonial. And how do you get at that and how do you do that is the work I'm engaged in <laughs> very simply um, with um, a reclaiming, not, not a, a non-critical reclaiming that the past was somehow perfect, but that there was some aspects of the relationship between individuals and land um, during let's say the reconstruction period that required a particular relationship with indigenous communities that often was intertwined that often was um, familial, um, not always, but in many instances. And so there has to be, and I think there's great writers, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about T.L. King and other black geographers that are deeply engaged in uh, black and indigenous land conversation, 
This is a huge conversation. But I think when it comes to planning our difficulty and especially in historic preservation is we have these tropes and these attachments. And so it's either, you know, are you interested in more money to support or to make sure that black farmers have their due? And in that conversation, you know, because of the relationship between African Americans and the USDA, for example, in that conversation, where do we talk about decolonization? They're not interested in talking to you. Now they're talking about justice, but I think that, that, that it's very, very important that we begin to have these grounded conversation as the redistribution, redistribution of money and so-called, you know, um, addressing poverty and, and all of that is gonna be in our orbit very soon as this 1.9 trillion gets out there. Um, and if we are in this conversation we are now and not engaged with what that is about to do and where that money will go, then this conversation might as well never have existed because it's gonna change the dynamic uh, between certain African-American parts of the African-American community who will be able to attain that money and use it in certain ways. If we're not looking at this fundamental relationality internalization of some of those ideas about sovereignty and land that are colonial, <laughs> are complicit with the colonial, right? Thank you. Anyone uh, else? Aaron, you're, you're muted. I can't agree more that there is a direct relation between sovereignty, powers, oppression, and, and uh, colonialization, and property. Uh, and of course, it's, it's complex. Uh, I want to first also say that uh, the, the worry that An Ananya uh, expressed, of course, is a real worry. Every uh, critique uh, can be sanitized, can be co-opted, can be used by, the, you know, it's our role to continue the real meaning of something. And I, rem I was a, a year in UCL last year, and I remember that they kept talking about decolonizing uh, uh, geography, and it actually meant adding a couple of references to a reading list that someone from Africa, you know, this was, you know, perhaps good intention, but when we talk about decolonization, it's, it's, it's about the concrete life, the oppression, uh, the segregation, the evictions, etc. So I think this is up to us to use it, first of all, credibly. Colonization is not discrimination. And Chantal Moff has a very good discussion about oppression versus subordination, you know, there are various degree, we have to talk about it when it is, when people actually are structurally, institutionally and legally in a lower position, in a lower status within the same kind of uh, metropolis or the same kind of society, and then they are colonized. Uh, and we have many other fields to, to, of discrimination, of inequality, of, of movement that, that are important enough. So I, I think, uh, I, I take this uh, criticism very, very well. But again, like Vanessa said, when you move away from the liberal societies, it's much more concrete. It's much more obvious. Uh, and uh, you know, with 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 that, I also think about property in many other ways. Luckily, in the Middle East, we still have property systems that are not profit-oriented, subdivided, private freehold, and you can see the great advantage of them. I can even talk talk about my mom who is 94 year old, whatever, never had property, but she has had, a, a, she had un, a, a disputed security all her life because she was in a collective uh, 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 community. So I think uh, among uh, uh, the Bedouins too, tribal kind of uh, land holding is very, very important. Although the state is trying very hard to privatize it, to dispossess and privatize at the same time, but I think we have to also imagine as part of decolonization or reimagining planning is to be integrated with reimagining the property system to give people security, not profit. And of course, this is a long discussion, but uh, uh, all this is very, very important for our education, I think. I just wanted to add to that, Hiba, because I think this is such an important question. And um, um, the points that Andrea and Oren have made speak to the fact that, as Nicholas Blombie would say, there isn't a singular enactment of property, right? That a property is a set of material and discursive enactments. Possessive individualism um, is only one, one enactment of property. So in the movements in LA whose work um, I foregrounded, 
um, in the reclaiming movements, um, in, in sort of the rent, the talent union movements and the argument around rent is theft, what is very much at stake is a rethinking of those property relations that make up the US as a post colony, right? Um, and it's not just about the decommodification of land and housing. I think that's one piece of it. You know, what is social rent in relation to the social wage? But this is about precisely, as Andrea was saying, what does it mean then to um, make an argument about place and belonging and memory that is not tied to possessive individualism? And I will say that I know Libby Porter is speaking later today. This is something that Libby Porter pointed out a while ago that some of these claims makings take place in the language and in the framework of possessory recognizability. And it is important for us to think about other forms of recognizability that are not about possessive individualism. Amazing. Uh conversation I like can't, I'm and many people in the chat they can't have enough I can't have enough uh, so uh, unfortunately we don't have enough uh, enough time to respond to all the questions we'll send them later in case uh, you want to uh, think uh, uh, read through them uh, I want to thank you all again for this ama amazing conversation for the food for thought for like giving us for energizing us again uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And we continue, we reconvene at uh, two, uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, EST time, Eastern uh, New York time, basically, uh, with another panel, panel three, on rethinking uh, planning from the margins with, again, another set of amazing uh, scholars, Teresa Caldera, Akira Rodriguez, James Spencer, Libby Porter, and moderated by Dahlia Wandel uh, from MIT. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Anania. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Vanessa. And hope next time we meet in person. <laughs>